around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. As always, we'd like to welcome you today to our ministry. And uh, we just pray today that the spirit of grace will touch your heart and touch your life immensely. Uh, we're going to be speaking on the subject of fasting. That is one subject that I almost never hear being addressed. Preachers just don't preach a life of discipline, a life of consecration, a life of dedication, and a life of separation. Now, I know they say this is the 21st century, and we're dealing with the millennials, so we've got to understand it's different. No, my friend, that's what the enemy wants us to believe. If all the great patriarchs and even Christ our Lord fasted, I think it's important that we fast because fasting makes the child of God more sensitive to the Holy Ghost. We're going to set the dates January the 4th, excuse me, January the 14th through February the 4th. January the 14th through February the 4th. Those are the dates that we're setting. You don't have to fast the whole 21 days, but I invite you, I encourage you to find a place in those 21 days and take the time to dedicate yourself, to separate yourself unto the Lord for a time of prayer and of fasting. I am confident God will bless your efforts and he will bless you immensely. Fasting is a necessity in this hour in which we're living in because, regretfully, our world is spiraling out of control, and fasting will bring your life, your personal life, your personal walk with God back into the proper perspective. And our perspective must be one of spirituality and one possessing the divine nature of God. Without that, we'll all stumble We'll all fall and miss the mark. We want to play a beautiful song today by David Phelps. The song was written by Dottie Rambo many years ago, about 35, 40 years ago. The song is entitled, We Shall Behold Him. And that's exactly what the Bible says in 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. He, he's going to appear one day in his glory. And you will behold him, sinner or saint. Every eye shall behold him. I want to behold him as my Savior, not as my judge. But every eye, the Bible says in Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. So we're all going to see him. I want to speak to you today about fasting. To me, it's one of the greatest topics in the Bible, as far as doctrinally, that men should fast and pray. We hear very little said about it, because it means doing without food. And of course, Bible prophecy says, in the last days, they would be eating and drinking and surfeiting. Luke 21, 34 said, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. The word surfeiting there means overeating. 
surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. And of course, Jesus gave us that uh, passage himself in Matthew 24, 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. So Jesus said they would be eating and drinking and certainly you and I are witnessing that today. I want to be sharing some different things today on fasting and I hope it will pique your interest and will challenge you to want to fast and seek the face of God. Let me say, first of all, all Christians should fast. Every Christian should find the time and the place and fast. Now, concerning the length, the time, the duration, and the type of fast should be based upon the need or simply just how hungry are you for Jehovah to grant you a divine answer or to grant you a divine revelation? The reason I worded that statement that way, how hungry you are for Jehovah to grant you a divine answer or to grant you a divine revelation. God can do both through your fasting. I know by experience, I know by empirical knowledge what God is able to do. It was in May of 1994 when God began to trouble my life. He began to trouble my nesting place. He began to trouble my my level and my depth of spirituality. And I, I, I knew there was something missing. I knew I was incomplete. I knew there was a void. There was a vacuity. There was something that was tremendously missing in my life and in my ministry. And I was aware of it. Some of you are aware that there's something lacking. There's something missing. There's something that you need to know that you can't seem to get the knowledge of. Or you need to be at a particular place and you're being hindered from getting there. Or you're seeking a deeper revelation in the word of God. I know, as I said, by experience, because it was in May of 1994 on a Sunday morning, standing in the pulpit, I made this statement. I will not eat a bite of food until God moves in my life. And in this ministry, like I feel, he needs to move. Now, when I made that statement, I'm a man of integrity. I figured I would fast 14, maybe 21 days. I had been on several 21-day fast at that point in time in my life. Now, I know I get emails and I get bashed because I talk about my fast. We have a record of so many people in the Bible fasting because God want us, wanted us to know about their fasting. I'm trying to share my testimony with you. I'm not bragging. I'm not extolling or lauding or touting my personal spiritual experiences. I'm just sharing my testimony as Paul the Apostle shared numerous times his Damascus Road experience. And yet people who are bigoted and arrogant will clamor me and bash me for no reason at all. But I made that statement. I will not eat a bite of food until God moves in my life and in my ministry like I feel he needs to move. And I always start my fast on a Sunday after I ate dinner with my family. I would always start my fast then. As I said, I assumed... I was being presumptuous, I suppose, that my fast would be 14 or 21 days, but it was on the 
21st day that the Spirit of God spoke to my heart standing in the kitchen, drinking a glass of water or a partial glass. I couldn't hardly drink anything at that point as far as your stomach gets full so quick. And the Lord said, on the 35th day of your fast, I'm going to move on you like you've never had me to move on you before. And I'm standing there and I'm saying, 14 days, that's 35, I'll be in the 35th day of this fast. And I go look on the calendar and it would be on a Sunday. On the 35th day of my fast, went to church on Sunday just as always. We had a good service, but it was not nothing like I felt God had spoken to my heart. We get in the car, we're driving home, and I say to my wife, well, I suppose I missed God. I said, the Holy Spirit, I was confident, I was certitude that the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart and said, I'm going to move on you on the 35th day of your fast like I've never moved upon you before. And she looked at me, she said, well, we still have tonight's service. You see, God never does anything like you think he's going to do it. We go home, we leave and go back to church Sunday night. And I've shared this testimony. It's in my book, The Second Coming, A Second Look. I go to the pulpit. Sister Coffey was playing the piano. The girls were singing at the microphones very softly. And I just walked to the pulpit and I had a little brown New Testament Bible, and I laid it on the center of the pulpit. And I said, all I want to do is worship God. That's all I want to do. And I turned to the girls, and I said, you can stop singing and just go ahead and go sit down. And they gave me one of those crazy looks like, what are you doing, Pastor? The truth is, didn't know what I was doing. I just wanted to worship God. Sister Coffee continued to play on the piano, and I finally turned to her and I said, Sister Coffee, would you just stop playing and be seated? She quit, got off the stool, piano stool, went down and sat, I'll think about the second pew from the front. And I looked up and I saw a bluish, grayish cloud, like a billowing cloud, begin to roll in the ceiling, the sanctuary. And I knew I was about to have a divine visitation from God. And I remember the Holy Ghost fell on me. And he fell on me so powerfully that it struck me down. Now I know people say, I don't believe in that. Well, go back and read the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew when Jesus, they came to arrest Jesus, and he said, whom seek ye? And they said, well, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And when he said that, the Bible said they all fell to the ground. Now, that's, that is so powerful that just... His mere statement, I am, I am he. And they fell backwards, the Bible says. And that power, that, that, that anointing was so overwhelming, so overwhelming that it caused them to fall to the ground. I know some people question other people's spiritual experiences. But I promise you, those Roman soldiers that came to arrest him knew a far greater, a far reaching power had smote them and they knew it. They knew it. I, I said, uh, that was in the 26th chapter of Matthew. I'm wrong. It's in the 18th chapter of John. I got it confused. But it was in the 18th chapter of John when he asked them, 
whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. The Bible said they went backward. They fell backward to the ground. So I, I experienced that power as it smote me, not in violence, not in wrath, but just the power of God overwhelmed my heart. And I remember lying there on my back trembling. I mean trembling and shaking. And I remember I said, God, if you do not take this off of me, you're going to kill me. That's, that's what I have come to understand. God's presence will, will, for a better lack of terms, suck the life out of a human body. When you read John, you read Daniel, these men fell as dead men. They fell as dead men. Why? The presence of God is so unfathomable. It's, 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 it's beyond anything that we can remotely try to understand or try to comprehend. It, it is, it is mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. And the, the life the human mortal life is as though it's, it is sucked out of the, the man, the woman, whoever the, the person might be when God shows up in that manner. And he, again, he didn't come to me in wrath. He didn't come to me in anger. He came to me because I was hungry. I was so hungry for God. And I said, I won't eat a bite of food until God moves in my life or God moves in this ministry like I feel he needs to move. And I remember as the glory of God had inundated that place, I had two people, a brother and a sister, said they saw fire streaming and running across the top of the ceiling in the church. Brother Jerry Garrett He's dead now, and Sister Lois Meadows, she's still living. She must be pushing 90. And I remember saying, God, if you don't take this off of me, you're going to kill me. Now, he knew he wasn't going to kill me, but I didn't know that because I had never been privileged to be in that dimension with God. There are dimensions. There are levels and spirituality with God, just as there are in demons and principalities and powers of the earth. There are different levels. And I was in a, a place, a posture, a position, a level where I had never been before in my life. Now, I've had numerous encounters with God in different ways, different means and methods. I won't get into those today. It's not apropos to what I'm trying to convey but I remember lying there in the floor, and all of a sudden, as I was looking up kind of toward the back right side of the sanctuary, I began to have a vision. And I saw the glory of God coming down. And what I saw was the Old Testament tabernacle. The glory of God would come down into the Holy of Holies, and God would accept that blood sacrifice that that shed blood that was put on the mercy seat once a year for atonement of sins and what i saw was an entourage of angels and they go before god himself and they prepare a highway of holiness god's not going to cross god's not going to tread in a place of filth and of degradation. And that's one of the problems with the church today. The church, as we know it, the nominal church is filthy. It is immoral. There is sin in the camp. And Isaiah 35 and 8 says, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. What the Lord showed me was there's a highway of holiness prepared for his coming, for his presence in that dimension, that level. And those angelic hosts are preparing a, a highway of holiness. 
And of course, we know in, in the Old Testament, if the high priest had sin in his life, he would die while behind the veil and God would kill him. And so there were pomegranates designed like bells on the bottom of his robe, his garment. And as long as the other temple priests could hear the, the bells, they knew he was alive. And there were those they tied ropes around their ankles. So if God struck them dead, so the, the other temple priests would not have to go behind the veil, they would just drag them out with the rope. I've read under some Jewish scholars, some Jewish theologians, there were those priests that were so consecrated, so dedicated, the other temple priests would keep them up all night long lest they dream a dream and defile their conscience and then go behind the veil the next day and the, offer this sacrifice in regards to the Day of Atonement. Better as Yom Kippur. Yom, Y-O-M, is day. Kippur is atonement. Yom Kippur, some people pronounce it the other way. But once a year, the high priest would go behind the veil and offer that sacrificial blood. And God was showing me in this vision the gravity, the magnitude of the Old Testament tabernacle, the Old Testament temple, and how it all applies to Christ. Everything that you see, everything that you witness in the Old Testament tabernacle deals with Jesus. The brazen altar where they would shed the blood and then put the offering on the altar and burn it. Fire represented Pentecost, and the shedding of blood represented Calvary. I need to redo my teachings on the Old Testament tabernacle. I've got it on CD. I need to get it on DVD because it is so significant to say the least. Then behind that brazen altar between the brazen altar and the holy place is the polished laver, the polished laver, which had water in it. That polished laver is where the high priest would go and wash his hands and remove the blood. That water typifies the word of God. Ephesians 5 and 26, that it might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word of God. And then you have the holy place. That would be the third level. The, uh, the, the uh, brazen altar and the polished labor is in what we call the outer court. There are three dimensions, three levels of the tabernacle or the temple. It's the outer court, it's the holy place, and then the holy of holies. The high priest and the temple priest were allowed to go into the holy place every day to service the holy place, but they can only go behind the other veil once a year. They were always servicing the menorah, the golden lamp stand with seven golden lamps. That's what they would service. They would put new oil and new wicks and the bulbs, the almond bulbs, and they would extinguish five, put new olive oil in there, and new wicks. The other two that were left burning would relight the five. They had a spare in case one went out. That's why they left two burning. Then they would re relight the last two, and they were servicing the menorah, the seven golden candlesticks, because the the lamp of God was to never go out. You'll find that it did go out in 2 Samuel chapter 3. It, it, it was a terrible time in Israel. And uh, it, it was well, it was just, it was, it was, a, it was a, well, it was an unbelievable time. Uh, I think I said 2 Samuel. It's 1 Samuel because Samuel was, was the, the, uh, prophet that God was needing. And if you'll go back to 1 Samuel chapter 3, you can see where the Bible says in verse 3, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. That was a sin in itself. When you go back and you study the protocol 
in the temple, the holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place, the the, the lampstand was to never go out. But the Bible tells us here in 1 Samuel 3 that Eli's eyes had waxed dim. He could not see physically, but that was just an outward sign of what was in him spiritually. See? See? And, and, and so this lampstand was to burn always. You'll find that in uh, Exodus 27, verse 20. Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. See, the lamp was to never go out because the lamp is a type of Jesus Christ. Uh, John 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He That lamp was to always burn. But in Eli's day, as he was high priest and judge, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, uh, Phinehas' wife uh, had the child. She died giving birth, and uh, she called the child Inkibod, uh before she died, Inkabod simply means the glory of the Lord is departed because the Philistines had stolen the ark, the ark of the covenant. And that was symbolic of the presence of God. Now the presence of God had departed. The glory of God was now gone. And what I've always found intriguing and unfathomable and amazing is that Phineas' wife, we don't even know her name, Phineas' wife, said in uh, 1 Samuel 4 and 21, she named the child Ichabod, saying the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She placed the blame on Eli and on her husband's sins. She understood. She understood why Israel was in the shape and the capacity that they were in because of their sins. Even Eli said, sons, the report I hear among you is an evil report. It's an evil report. You see, he didn't bother to deal with their sins just like a lot of preachers today won't even mention the word sin. That's right. That's right. They don't even want to talk about sin. They don't want to mention sin. And Eli, God, I don't have, I'm not going to get into all of this, but he, he had already told Samuel as a child, he's going to cut off the arm of Eli that he would no longer have a part of the priesthood. And so his two sons were killed in that battle when the Philistines got the Ark of the Covenant. And then when the servant got back to the temple, he shared with Eli and he shared with the community what had happened. The Bible said that Eli fell backward off the gate and his neck broke and he died for he was an old man and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years. That heaviness talks about his obesity. But I look at that in a spiritual application. It caused his heart to become uncircumcised. It caused his eyelids uh, to be uh, so overweight in the context that he couldn't see anymore, either spiritually or physically. See, because the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 3 that his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. This is the condition of the church. The leaders cannot see. They don't want to see. This is why fasting strips the flesh. Everything I'm I'm sharing about Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, it's all about their carnality. It's all about their flesh, their obesity, their adultery, and, and, and Eli's unwillingness to deal with their sins. He just wouldn't deal with it. See? No. He would he would he even told his sons. I, the report that I hear, it, it's an evil report. See, he didn't, he didn't want to deal with it. They're, 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 they're preachers today. They don't want to deal with the sin. No, they don't want to deal with the sin. 
Why? Because it might offend somebody. But this is the, this is the carnality that has come into the church. This is the carnality that has taken a place and a strong hold in the church. And they lost God's presence, the Ark of the Covenant. You see, fasting deters carnality. Fasting deters your unbelief. In the 17th chapter of the book of Matthew, the disciples could not cast out the demon out of the man's child who the Bible said he was a lunatic. And he would oftentimes cast himself into the fire or water. See, that was the demon that was doing that. Lunatic, lunar, moonstruck. I won't get into all of that, but if you want to dissect the word lunatic, go ahead. The disciples could not cast the demon out. Jesus, of course, he came. He cast the demon out. He said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. He's rebuking his disciples. So after he cast the demon out, the child is cured, and they got a little bit away from the situation. The disciples came to Jesus and said, why could we not cast him out? He said, because of your unbelief. Your unbelief. And then he concluded in Matthew 17, 21. He said, how be it? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. He said, you've got to fast and pray. Prayer's not enough. You've got to fast. They couldn't understand why they couldn't cast out the demon. Jesus said, I'm telling you, prayer sometimes is not enough. You must fast. Well, what is fasting, pastor? Fasting means to do without food. And every time I get on this subject, and we do this every year, I've been doing this, I wouldn't be afraid to say, for the last decade. I remember in 2012, the Lord gave me one word, acceleration. He said, everything will begin to accelerate. That's all. I fasted 21 days, and I got one word. And, and people that know me have said, that was a word from God, just one word. Because it, that following summer, the Supreme Court justices adjudicated the 14th Amendment, said now same-sex couples can get married. Look, since then, Donald Trump has said, we're going to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. God said, everything's going to accelerate, accelerate. And I've had people remind me that was such a powerful word because we've seen an acceleration in everything. I mean, it's like everything has just sped up, sped up. But as I said, I've been doing this, I wouldn't be afraid to say, for the last 10 years, I've always fasted, but I've, I've tried to call the radio audience with me in January. It's a good time to fast. It's cold. You can't get outside. You can't do much. It's a good time to fast and to pray. Amen. Fasting simply means to do without eating. Why is fasting so hard for me, preacher? Man fell because of his disobedience and he ate. He, what he ate was in disobedience, was in opposition to what God commanded him. I'm going to share something here today. Some of you may know this. Some of you may not know this. But when God gave this commandment, Adam was still alone. Adam was not married yet. God had not given him a spouse and put him to sleep yet. If we take the chronology of the scriptures, it is clear. Genesis 2, verses 15 and 16 says this, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That word dress in the Hebrew means to till the soil, to work it. God believes in work. God is not a welfare God. God only intervenes 
when you've done everything you can do and there's nothing left to do, God will then intervene. You do your part, God will always make up the difference. He put Adam in, in the garden and he said, dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. Notice what it says in verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man. Singular. Where was Eve? She wasn't there. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now watch this, verse 18, Genesis 2 and 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. I will make him a help meet for him. So that tells me Adam was alone. That tells me that Adam told Eve, we cannot partake of this fruit now because Eve was flesh of his flesh, bone of his bones. She, you might say, became rebellious. Maybe that's a poor choice of words. But I do know Satan, Nahash, did not come to Adam, he came to Eve. Because in the third chapter of the book of Genesis, we see that confrontation. We see that frontal confrontation with the serpent, Satan, the devil. He comes to the woman and he says, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And then the devil said, Ye shall not surely die. Here's where the devil deceived her and tricked her. For God knoweth that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Here was the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in Genesis 3 and 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. 1 John 2, 15, 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it is of the world. That's the same three gates. That's the same three avenues that Satan used on Eve saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life. Did you know that's the same three things that the devil did to Jesus? Those are the same three temptations in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Those are the same three temptations temptations. The tempter came to Jesus and said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. There's your lust of the flesh. He takes him up to the holy temple. He sits him on a pinnacle of the temple. And in my book, Revelation 13, I tell you what that pinnacle is. It sets over the uh, Ark of the Covenant. He wanted Jesus Christ to jump off, which would have, in theory, created a premature abomination of desolation. See, that was the pride of life. He took him to this pinnacle of the temple and said, cast thyself down. That would be pride to call the angels now and say, bear me up, lest I dash my foot against a stone. Then he said, 
the Jesus says, of course, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Then the devil takes him to an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said, if you'll just fall down and worship me. This was the lust of the eyes. Same three gates. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Genesis chapter 3. Matthew chapter 4, and of course I quoted from John, 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it is of the world. For all, I want you to get that, for all, the only thing that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Now, what did Jesus do in Matthew chapter 4? He kept his body in subjection. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Jesus had to be tempted just like man was so he would understand you and me thoroughly. Hebrews 4, 15 says, for we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, I heard a guy one time say Jesus lusted. That's not true. That would be contrary to the Scriptures. That would be contrary to what James said. Jesus did not lust. He didn't get that far. You and I have gotten that far before regretfully. Jesus didn't get that far. You don't want to get that far. No, you don't want to get that far. James 1.13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. And enticed, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Jesus did not lust. Satan tried to get him to lust, and, and that lust conceive and bring forth sin. Then Jesus Christ could have not been the uh, uh, divine atonement for mankind. No, he couldn't. It would have been impossible, absolutely impossible. But, again, Paul tells us in Hebrews 4.15, for we have not an high priest. Jesus Christ is our high priest. He's not an high priest which cannot be touched or does not understand our weaknesses, our afflictions, our fragility, our infirmities. We don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. There's nothing wrong in a temptation. It's when you yield to it. That's when you sin. That's when the transgression occurs. It's when you yield to the temptation. Let's just use a $10 bill and you, you, you know it's not yours. You walk into a room, you know it's not yours, and the devil tempts you to pick it up and put it in your pocket. You gave over to the temptation, therefore you sinned. I'll really make some of you mad now. You're already stealing. If you're not tithing and giving, you're robbing God, you're stealing God from God. Let me tell you, when I got saved, nobody told me to pay my tithes. Nobody told me to give. Nobody told me to fast. Something happened in me that I knew these are the right things to do as a Christian. Luke 6, 38, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosoms. 
And I hear people say, oh, that's the law. That's the law. Abraham tithed 430 years before there ever was a law. So don't, 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 you see, you're, you're a carnal Christian. You're looking for a way to get out. You're, you're a deadbeat spiritually. You want to beat God. <laughs> I've said this so many times. God don't need your money. You need God's blessing. When I write a check or I give money uh, to, to other ministers or, or missions or whatever, you think God needs my money? God's created a system where we can be blessed. Even in the Old Testament economy, maybe you couldn't offer up a, 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 a bullock, a ram, a, even a turtle dove. God said, well, just bring me a meal offering. Ground up wheat, just bring me a meal offering. I mean, everybody had meal. Even the widow woman at Zarephath. She had a little oil in her, in her a cruise of oil and a little bit of meal in her barrel. God fixed it where everybody can tithe. That's what's, that's what's great about tithing. It's fair. A man makes $1,000 a week. He ties $100 a week. A man makes $10,000 a week. He gives $1,000 a week. See, God's not unjust. God's not unkind. But see, people who fast and pray realize they, they owe something back to God. Now, your works, your giving, your tithing, that does not save you. That does not redeem you. That does not forgive you. You do those things because you are saved. You do those things because you are redeemed. You do those things because you love God. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I love God. But he said, they honor me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You know, this is why when you get saved, you, you, you start dropping down your roots in the ground and you start praying. You start reading your Bible. You start giving. It becomes a part of your disciplinary life. The life of a disciple is disciplined to the tenets and the dogma and the doctrine of Christ. If you don't do that, you're just honoring God with your mouth. That's like saying, I love my children, but I don't care whether they have clothes or food to eat. I don't care. One smart aleck wrote me a letter some time ago. I ought to call his name, but I won't do it today. I'll be a good preacher. I'll be a good pastor. Because somebody was selling DVDs, he thought I needed to be warned. And he did it in a very subtle way, and he sent me a $100 gift. Well, I put his money back in the envelope, and I said, I'm not a hireling. You think you're going to rebuke me? and put a check in the mail, and somehow that justifies your rebuke. I am not a hireling. I never have. I never will be. I'll never ask you for a dollar on this radio program. I never will. No, sir. When the money dries up and the money's gone, I'll come on the radio and say, we're broke. God bless you. It's been great. I'll see you in heaven. But I'm not going to ask you for money. How can I preach God supply your need and not believe God to supply my need. Any preacher that begs for money, there's something wrong with him. Jesus never begged for money. Paul never begged for money. God blessed Job. God blessed Abraham. These men were wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. We've been doing this now for 21 years, international radio ministry. We're not going to beg for daily bread. We're just not going to do it. We fast, we pray, we expect God to take care of us. That's It's just that simple. You know, I, I'm not going to be like the world and try to sucker people and dupe people and send me uh, $279 because this number means this and that. I'm just I'm I'm just not gonna I'm not gonna do that. That's that's a huckster, that's a hireling. 
You know, that's, that's all that is. And there, there are guys out there that do that. that. That's all they do. They shake people down. They're of the flesh. They mind the things of the flesh. They don't mind the things of the spirit. They don't challenge you to fast and pray. They just challenge your pocketbook. There's nothing spiritual about that. When you get spiritually right with God, you will give. I'm trying to challenge you beyond your pocketbook. I want to challenge you in the, in the gifts of the Spirit and the deeper things of God. Fasting and prayer where you become a mighty man, a mighty woman of valor, a great stalwart soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ. And these, these menial things, giving and, 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 and being faithful, that, 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 that's just innate. It, it's just there. It's just there. But oh, when you start fasting, you start seeking the deep things of God. Oh, how things began to change and change quickly. My time is gone. Wow. Didn't, didn't get to finish. I, I may pick this up uh, next program, and uh, we'll see where we go from there. But this is a great time. For you to set aside, we're setting the dates, January the 14th through February the 4th. I'm not asking you to fast 21 days. I'm just asking you during this time of 21 days to fast with me. Our nation is in trouble. Things are very tenuous. The battle is the Lord's. But if we fast and we pray, we cry out to God, God can change the course. God can change the direction. God can change the plots, the plans, and the snares of the devil. And there's no doubt in my mind, I have no reservations, that the devil is plotting something evil and the unraveling of our nation. God bless you. Have a great, great, great day in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He always has been. He will forever be the answer to his people. God bless you. I challenge you. Set aside some time to pray and to fast, and you will see the reward of the Lord the Jesus Voice Christ. Of evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.